Welcome back to the Interior Analysis Podcast. I am your host for this one, Jelani Kelly. I'm Evan Westman. I'm David Jones. And we're talking about a movie that I suggested, shockingly. Tick, Tick, Boom. on Now on Netflix. Directed by Lin-Manuel Miranda. Didn't know he directed it before I watched it. I did watch a good chunk of the credits, though. I never do that. But it's because of the song playing at the end. But... It's a musical little movie. Uh, I think it's an Oscar nominee, right? Yeah. I think it's up it for is. Garfield as an actor and then I think editing and... I'm going to check. I think that's it, though. When are the Oscars? This weekend? This weekend? I believe so. Props to this movie. Yeah, it is just editing and Garfield. Okay. It did feel very oscar baity. There's a lot of crying, a lot of drama, just like the Oscars like. So... Mm-hmm. Hoping Garfield wins though. I don't know who else is up. Who who who's up for best actor as well? I hope it goes yeah. to Will Smith. Okay, well Will Smith over Garfield. I I can't go against the black person. So, like him and King Richard. To anybody who has seen it. Yeah, I saw King team. Richard. I I don't think this for Garfield or King Richard for Will Smith. I don't think it's either of their best performances. But I'm very good with either of them getting an Oscar. Like they both have earned it at this point. Will doesn't have an Oscar, right? I don't think. Yeah, I don't I even know. To give him one. How much has he even if been he nominated? If he doesn't have one, he's gonna get an honorary one pretty soon. He's done too much. Yeah, like King Richard should be like you know how Leo has done a bunch of movies and he never won Oscars, but they like gave him one for The Revenant, even though mm-hmm. that wasn't his best performance. Like they should Willie Smith. Yeah, you know? the Oscars isn't always good at at like predicting what's actually gonna be that like nobody's talking about the King speech ten years later. But yeah, I guess yes. people were at the time. So he's up against, uh, I'm, I'm just looking up, he's up against Will Smith, Denzel Washington, Javier Bardem, and Benedict Cumberpatch. What um, did Washington do? Tragedy of Macbeth. Did not know that was a movie. Did you know it was pronounced Denzel? What? No, I didn't. Yeah. On the, Is I think Denzel it was, Washington? On the, I think it was, he said it on the Graham Norton show, I think, because I recognize that orange and pink background anywhere. It's Denzel Washington. And does he prefer that over Denzel? I don't know. I just saw the clip and I was like, hmm, cool. I'm still going to call you Denzel. (laughs) Definitely Denzel Washington. I mean, I don't know if he cares, though, because it's the first time I'm hearing of it. So Yeah, he's had a long time to correct people. Yeah. What are we talking about? Oh, yeah, I have to either go uh, Denzel or uh, Will because I'm – being black, I don't think I'm legally allowed to go against black actors when they're up for Oscars, um, especially considering how little black people have won at the Oscars. Definitely one of them. Does, does Washington has an uh, Oscar, right? For he training must day? at this point. He's got training to have day. at least one. I think he has one for training oh, yeah, he's, he, he has, has two. He has two. Okay. I'm checking for what. What was the second? Yeah. Yeah, Training Day and Glory. Glory. And he's oh. got like seven other nominations. Great. So he won for the time he played a person that got whipped in Revolutionary War around uh, where they put black people at the front line. Is that what it is? I've never seen Glory. Yep, unfortunately. And the other one is where he's playing a corrupt, thuggish cop. Cool. Thanks, Oscars. Let's see. What were we talking about? Oh, Oscars, this movie, it was mid I'm, I'll get into that. I, I didn't write much, but I was just about to rant before we started recording, and Evan stopped me. He was like, save it for the podcast. And I was like, you're right, this content. <laughs> that is what we're here for. <laughs> content. <laughs> so, initial reactions. Uh, either one of you, just, just go ahead. Go. I'll go. My initial reaction was... Mm-hmm. No. Oh man. Oh man. When he got to the workshop and I was like, all right, this is it. This is what he's been talking about for the past. I don't even know because Netflix doesn't tell you. And then he after went, I got through that and I was like, holy shit, I have an hour and 20 left. Okay. Yeah. And then I rechecked again and I had like 40 minutes left and then I had 20 minutes left. I was constantly rechecking, which means I'm not into it. Mm. And I tried to look for silver linings. Like, I was like, okay, like, it's a cute kind of message. Like, when his person, his agent's like, 
and he's like what do i do rosa or whatever her name is and she's like you keep writing i'm like okay this is cute like we love that boost to the old morale and then like all the stuff at the end with his old roommate and him getting hiv it just felt so weirdly out of place and i was like what is this movie yeah that was my whole initial reaction i think yeah so before I get into my initial reactions, just the couple things that, like the minimal knowledge I had beforehand. I have never seen Rent. I know a few songs of it. Most of my knowledge comes from Lindsay Ellis's video on it, which does not paint it in a terribly favorable light. So that, I tried not to take that into this, but it was a form of knowledge. And then like a few weeks ago, I saw somebody sing, or I guess two people, sing therapy at a cabaret that i had a few friends in which one is that which scene i have a problem that you'd have a problem that oh one. i mm -hmm. that was oh my god i wanted to mute there that song was so stupid i want to get into it a little bit because i thought the way they did that scene was interesting and i have a feeling that it's not the way they do it in the musical somebody if you know please tell us if like if you have seen the musical like, tell us that, if it's different here, because I was be the, interested to know. That was the one with Garfield and Hudgens, right? And they were just sitting on the stools, yeah. and it was the and breakup. Kind oh, of like, my. Kind of do like a bing, bang, bing, bang, and there was the lighting. and That was cringy, man. Mm -hmm. I, but I think that's the point, right? It was gross. I, You're supposed to be like, oh, my God, like, because they're so, like, perpetually forcing it. I will say I enjoyed the rhyme schemes in that song. Like, I'm a fan of Sondheim, where you can make the same, like seven rhymes out of like the word purpose and like have it be really cool and reveal character and some of the songs did that those are bars those are called bars david yes yes Lil love me a that. bar Lil Wayne doesn't and that. the multiple of them bars <laughs> but i don't recall many of them from this movie mm. Yeah, I gotta say the songs didn't stick with me, like, immediately after. I, I've listened to the songs a couple times in the past few days just to refresh, but none of them, aside from therapy, really stuck with me. And that was, I, I only remember that one because it was the only one I'd heard before. It's not, like, terrible, but it's it, it's not a great sign. Yeah, like both of you, yeah, I'd say this is mid-tier. Nothing really bad stood out, but nothing really good either. I feel like those be the worst movies to talk about, though, because I don't feel strongly either way about it. I think there's still stuff that's interesting to talk about with it, but yeah, I don't feel terribly strongly about it. What I yeah. do appreciate is that it does feel like it comes from a pretty honest place, and even if it doesn't always work for me, like that does count for a lot, I think. I agree. Most of my enjoyment was derived from the fact that I knew... Lynn Manuel was the director, so he was coming from this at like a first hand kind of POV, and he mm -hmm. knows what it's like to be a struggling musical theater writer trying to get a deadline or get in to see somebody who's kind of been in the business. And those are the moments in the directing that I enjoyed it. So I really give most of my enjoyment to the directing. I'm not sure if I had seen the original piece of work, the one man rock monologue that is Jonathan Larson, like at a keyboard, like yelling and like running kind of insanely between different instruments and portraying all these different characters. Cause apparently it's only three people. Like if you, the original is just three actors playing like 30 different characters. Oh boy. And I feel like that would be a lot. <laughs> yeah. And kind of like overwhelming. So I understand how Lynn probably had a lot to undertake when he came to thinning out the songs and trying to pull a thematic thread through an otherwise like abstract character study. But it was fine. It's definitely a movie that I feel like you could lose 30 to 40 minutes and it would be probably better because it's yeah. just, it feels long. Like, and it's not long, but it feels so long. It's two hours. I mean, right, like, I shouldn't be feeling like I just watched, like, Lord of the Rings Extended Edition during your two-hour movie. I didn't think it felt that long, but it definitely could have been shorter. No, it did, and I've never seen Lord of the Rings, but it, I, it I, felt I think like I... four hours to me. Like, it felt like I watched Peter Jackson, and they just gave him his full extra hour, and I was like, wow. I thought I'd be more invested because writing, and that's what... The trailer got me, man. I had no idea how people went about writing musicals 
again, I said the trailer got me because I thought I'd relate to John, feel like he's run out of time, which I kind of did. And it was the tick to tick theme, and you know, <laughs> I didn't. It, I don't feel strongly either way. It was it was just mid, man. I thought I'd, I I expected more from it. I expect to like at least one song. I mean. The Come to Your Senses song was cool, but that's because of the emotional weight behind it. It's not a bot though. Like I'm not I'm not finna add that to the playlist. I'm not adding any of these. Especially that. Is there like an anti playlist I can add that <laughs> that therapy song to? Cause my God did I hate that. And the diner one. That was so pointless. The I diner understand. one was not great. Thirty ninety is to... I thought it thirty ninety's okay. That's like the closest to a banger that they get. If the Oh boy. We don't have that many topics. We're probably going to keep this podcast shorter than the movie. So uh, let's just jump into movie musicals and adaptation. Again, I didn't like any of the songs. Come to your senses was cool. Growing up, I never really cared for musicals. Only thing that can be redeeming about them for me is if I can find a song that I listen to like on its own. Uh, so a lot of Disney stuff, really. Like, Make a Man, everybody loves this song. Yo, that is the best musical song ever. Okay, let's calm down. Um, I've never seen The Greatest Showman, but I have, like, three songs from that. I mean, I'm kind of with Evan on Make a Man, but Lion King has a lot of slaps, too, because it's black people singing, I think. Uh, so that's... That'll the, be I, the I think is really <laughs> important there. <laughs> Elton John covers. It was There's... 1990s Disney with a score by a, a white British man. Oh boy. Um, uh, Elton John has good anyway. covers for Lion King, though. It wasn't him singing all the songs, though. Like not in the movie, but he has a he has some great covers of them. The Circle of Life song. Yeah, he, that, he wrote that one... them, so he has the right to cover them. He wrote Circle of Life. He did the whole thing. Oh my God! What? He, but the, the African language. Oh, that's not him. I don't think he's not singing, but he he did all of the he did the oh. music for Lion King, and then he also is the one who brought it to Broadway. Him and Tim Rice. Life is a lie. I mean, I guess that's that's Disney though. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. You're just listening. My dreams being shattered. Uh, what what else do we have for uh, music? Well, one thing that I I kind of said this already, but I wonder if they changed. They might have done this with multiple songs. I could feel with therapy, like where it's intercutting between him performing the song and then the argument between him and uh, Susan. And I was thinking, like, that doesn't feel like something that would work on stage. I'm going to guess that was added. Again, if somebody knows, please let us know. I thought that was kind of a nice use of adapting from stage to screen. This is a conversation I've had with a couple of actor friends over the past like few months occasionally is just like when does stuff work on stage versus in a movie? I found a letterbox list that I'll link to that's just all let me double check films that were made into Broadway musicals. So stuff that was first a movie and then they made a show out of it, not the other way around. A lot of them are stuff that's a musical in the movie like mary poppins or uh like any disney thing like aladdin beauty and the beast little mermaid like obviously those are all musicals lion king lion king yeah but then some of them many of them are just regular non-musical movies that they turned into musicals some of them are really surprising devil wears prada apparently is a musical i didn't know that um Mrs. Doubtfire. I remember a friend told I'm me going about to that. See Mrs. Doubtfire. Ew. I can't wait. You know, I could name a few other weird ones. Legally Blonde. How about that? That's a Legally Blonde's a killer musical. Shrek the Musical. Uh, Shrek the Musical is my favorite. It's on Netflix. Everyone, give it a watch. Oh, I might have to check that out. I haven't. It's seen actually it really good. It's super underrated. What's another good one? Hairspray. Iconic. Hairspray was a comedy, and then they made it to a musical. Recent episode for us, Beetlejuice is. Beetlejuice. I think we brought that up. I th- one of us. SpongeBob, School of Rock. Oh yeah, I've seen School of Rock. Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, one that I have not seen, but it's one of my favorite movies. Amelie is a musical. 
Um, and it, it's not as a movie, but I've listened to the soundtrack of that or like the whatever, all the songs from it. I would be interested to see because I feel like that's a good one to adapt into a musical. Have either of you seen Amelie? No. Okay. Independent of this because we already did an episode on it. No. Nah. It's it's really I, I well. I want to see it. I know it's the, like the famous shot of that one girl, and she looks like real up close in the thing. I hate it. I don't she's like pale. See it. She has a she has a black bob. She's giving you those eyes with the red lip. Yeah, they I make like it. Audrey Tatau look really weird on the poster for some reason. To the point that it almost looks like it's a horror movie, but it very much is not. It might make me watch it if it was. That'd be cool if she just killed people. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, something tells me somebody has recut a trailer of Amelie to make it a horror movie. I bet that exists. In terms of musicals, like, that movie does a lot American of... American Psycho? Yeah, American oh, yeah, that Psycho was a... One. I bet that's a weird-ass musical. Another weird one is Young Frankenstein, the Mel Brooks movie. That that was a very weird musical. For Amelie, I feel like, like it makes sense to translate that from screen to stage. Like it uses film language in some really interesting ways. I like to compare it to Scott Pilgrim, and how it uses like certain special effects and stuff to show how characters are feeling. But it doesn't really exist in like like some of the stuff that you see isn't literally happening which works well for like songs because a lot of times like i guess it sort of depends on the musical but a lot of times songs aren't like obviously the character isn't literally singing they're just feeling and it, they're expressing it through song this was a i don't think it's his original quote but i have a friend who likes to say like in terms of singing in musicals he likes to say when the emotion becomes too strong for speech you sing and when it becomes too strong for song you dance i haven't really engaged with that at all in my own work because i can't really sing or dance but i think it's an interesting like approach to writing a musical thing i don't know if either of you have thoughts on that but that is like i, I it's a traditional theater saying because like Really, when it comes down to it, all of the best of the best is, at least in works of literature or fiction or storytelling, is how are we revealing the character? And with plays, we can reveal them through dialogue, because that's what we have our exposal the most. That's why those margins are like that. And with movies, we can reveal it visually, and that's why action margins are like that. And musicals are way in through characters, through song. And I can see the dance analogy... I also think some people are just, like, they're born dancers. So, like, when mm -hmm. they go and they take to the stage, it's like, well, which are you better at? Okay, you're going to do the... You're going to show this character off through dance. Cool. But I can see that. And I, I do think that's, like, a nice way to look at it. Because at the end of the day, like, the best songs in musical theater history are definitely the most character-revealing and usually the most vulnerable moments for the characters. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a super extensive knowledge of musical theater, but I I think I'd agree with that. It, it's just a really simple way of, like, showing how a character's feeling. Sometimes it's kind of cheap, but, like, it does work. Where I think it gets complicated, and I don't know how much we want to get into this, but there, there's a conflict that comes up when you put a song like an emotional song like that in a movie because on stage you can't really see an actor's face that well or at least you can't guarantee it if you're pretty close yeah but if you're bring some binoculars yeah and most people don't so you kind of have to be bigger when you're on stage to express that emotion like in a song or you know just larger body language but you can communicate so much emotion in one close-up. And I feel like there's something that becomes a problem when you're trying to express your biggest emotion in a song where we can see the actor's face the whole time. And they're because they're singing, they're not necessarily emoting um, with their face the way that maybe they would if you were just like playing their reaction to X moment in real time 
I, I don't know if there's like a lesson to take from that, but I feel like it is a mix of mediums that like it's a place where problems can come up. I definitely do think it comes down to a question of the medium and it's like with theater, you know, you have to, you have to be bigger. You have to, you have your whole body that people are looking at. You're not, you don't have the privilege to know, okay, this shot is going to just be a close up. So all I need is to show everything in my face. You have to kind of constantly be on, you're singing live, you're dancing live, you're reacting live in real time to any counterpart. You have a certain amount of space if you walk out of frame when you're filming, you could just call cut and walk back into your frame. If you walk too far off the stage and there's no more stage, you fall into the pit. <laughs> so there's a whole different reality there. You have to play to a live audience. It's not just a camera. So you kind of have to remember, you know, if you're going to be on stage, there's the three force rule, different things that you just have to have when you're on and theater forces that. And movies don't. And I think that's why a lot of movie musicals kind of fail, in my opinion, as someone mm -hmm. who likes musicals. And it's sad, but I don't know what the answer really is, because I don't know that many movie musicals that really, really get it. I can think of, like, one that's, like, a real live person one. Like, the other ones are, like, Disney animated. So then that's, like, a whole different conversation. What's the one? like hairspray but i feel like that only works because it originally was a movie so it's not that hard to kind of translate the three act structure back into it hmm. i saw hairspray for like a class i think it was a musical class that like i call it new but the more recent hairspray is like a film that was turned into a play back into a film yeah so originally it was a film in the 80s and it's a john waters film and it's super satire campy comedy there's no music in it and it was edna was always played by a man and that was originally divine and then in 2002 it got turned into a musical and that is when they added the music into it and harvey firestein played edna turnblad and then in like 2006 2007 they made a movie musical out of the musical that was based off the movie and John Travolta played Edna Turnblad. So it's always kind of been a tradition that a man plays the woman or the mom in that role. Why? It's part of the camp stick. Like, it makes more sense when you look at the original source material. Like, I'm not defending the John Travolta one. Like, it's kind of, it's a lot. But the original, like, divine John Waters 80s satire, it made more sense. It was about, it's all about the standards of beauty and what that does to teenage girls and even how that affects women in 1960s America. Welcome and it's to actually the 60s. pretty good. That's the only but, thing I know from that. And the musical's good too. The movie musical though? Welcome to that the definitely 60s. was a thing. It it did exist. It, it does did. exist. That people put work into that. But I think my issue with Tick Tick Boom the most as far as an adaptation is my favorite moments because like we're saying okay how are we going to reveal the character because that's really what this comes down to and the moments where lynn kind of merged musical with a movie like the moment i can think of is at the party when john just goes into like his song and he goes like bo 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 and he mm -hmm. just gets everyone to sing that felt good because it i like i did like that one it revealed the character musically which checks that box and it's not telling us it's not over narration we're in the scene it's showing us it's being shot in this kind of like smooth handheld steady cam way that it feels like we're in the party so it works thematically as well and i was just like okay this i can get into but the moments where like i guess it's nominated for editing because of this cross cutting but the moments where it would cross cut between like john which wasn't really John, but Andrew Garfield as John performing the one man rock monologue, tick, tick, boom. But when we would see the songs that he would actually had been performing in real life, we would see it as a movie that like tripped me up. I wish we just kind of left it as the movie. Like I didn't need to see the like fake version the show. of what actually happened. Mm hmm like him on stage yeah mm -hmm. like i don't know it was just weird like i just didn't really like it because i didn't like i said i don't think if i was 
in New York in the 90s and I saw Jonathan Larson's one man rock monologue and three characters are running over like an Egyptian rug for three hours while they play 72 different characters and it's just like vignettes of sadness I don't think I would enjoy myself Michael was the best character yeah is that his friend yep yeah without a doubt good acting as well he did good fantastic Uh, I felt for him when he revealed he had HIV I was like damn bro that's and he still showed up yeah and like, after they like just fought an and... or like pull anything over he was just like you know real like, one a right? real i was one. like this is good i like a that he calls one. out like a lot of john's like i don't know if i want to call it privilege i think some of it's privilege but some of it's just kind of selfishness selfishness yeah because yeah. i i didn't i didn't like john that much as a character but i was i found him a lot more palatable because Michael and Susan and maybe a couple other characters called out sometimes like like when Michael got his new job and John's like oh you're selling out like come on and and Michael like turns on him and says something like can you just be happy for me that I'm doing this like I have a steady job why why are you mad I was fully on Michael's side there and I I feel like it without that I would have really not been able to like i don't know if it's fair to say that i rooted for john i think minus that i might have just kind of lost that thread altogether i think definitely if somebody other than andrew garfield played him it would have been much harder to sell me because like pretty much it was just like andrew garfield's amazing charisma that kept me on the hook at all my scene that really allowed for me to still be able to handle him was the Susan scene where she comes to see like the rehearsal and she's like, can we just talk for like a couple minutes? Like, can you just call like a break for five minutes? And he was like, I don't take breaks. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh." And then she was like, really? And then he was like, yeah. And she was like, oh, okay, go work on the song. And then he turned around and then when he turned back, she wasn't there. I was like, thank God. Cause like, he's just such an asshole. Yeah. Yeah. I, (sighs) And, like, it's too bad, because I want to like Andrew Garfield. And I do like Andrew Garfield in this. No, I agree. I kind of hate John. His his phenomenal acting and his just, like, boyish charm allows for you to kind of be like, oh, John, you're going through it. You're you're not a good person, but you're going through it. So it's, it's good, because I did sit through almost the whole two hours of this movie, but... It, it, he is a rough, rough human being. Yeah. Uh, I I hate to say it, like, I, I feel like there's a number of things that he does that I definitely am guilty of in, like, a creative way. Like, I don't know if this transitions us too much into the next topic, but, like, when he's in the advert, like, the room with the advertising focus group, like, I, I've been that asshole in the classroom that's like, oh, I'm, like, so above this. Like, nobody else in here can write anything. And I hate that. I've I been believe that. <laughs> that guy. So, like, in a way, I get it when he's there, but I also don't sympathize because I it, it's a dick move. It's hard for me to be on his side. So I think part of it is just, like, hating stuff that I've done that he's also doing. I just wonder, like, how much the movie wants us to sympathize with him at various points because i think like there are places where it's critical of him like when his creativeness is eating away at his relationship with susan and michael there i think we're like it's it's being critical of him it's saying like no that's too much you're being selfish but at other points like the ad like the advertising focus group when he's like coming up with his lines first of all i was like it's not, like, that great of a line. Like, calm down, everyone. But I was wondering, like, does the movie want us to think, like, whoa, he, like, really can write? And what? I can't quite tell. Right, what? what? Like, when he comes up with, like, those slogans or whatever for the in the ad meeting, and everyone's, like, wowed by it. Like, are we as the audience also oh, supposed to be God. wowed? I was kind of cracking up at that scene my experience with that was like because i agree there's a lot because i think lynn is making this 
in some sense autobiographically from his own experience there's a lot of what if being a writer if you try to do this even semi-professionally you can relate to a lot of what he's going through and that was a moment where like i've been in internships and you know dare i say college classes where i would say the most like english 101 high school what is the meaning of the red dress type bullshit and they were just like oh chip chip cheerio here you go claps all around you're so good and you just are like wow this is i could do this forever but also no because this is disgusting <laughs> and like i yeah. don't ever want that and that was the moment i got for him where he was like yeah i uh this is not the company i will be selling my soul for so thank you goodbye i like the swimming scene yeah the swimming scene was cool i, I just well really just the reveal at the bottom where he comes up with the song mm -hmm. 30 and then the, the musical yeah. notes along the thing and then they pan out that was cool i like that too because it was like it utilizes everything that you can with this being cinema and not theater and then it also pays homage to previous like classical musical times of the hollywoods where people would swim and do weird shit in water in unison and people loved it in the 30s and 40s and that's like the vibe i got i was like okay oh, yeah, yeah like the synchronized swimming yeah especially with some of the overhead shots and everything i was like okay he's definitely lynn knows what he's doing from a directing standpoint right now and hollywood to speak of the oscars loves to talk about themselves so it's yeah. like whenever they can see like oh look we, we we brought another one up look at that look, look what we did they'll get they'll they'll nominate they love that i kind of just want to we'll go we'll come back to movie and musicals and adaptation if there's anything else for it but um let's smoothly transition to how it portrays the writing slash creative process for me this is not entirely accurate to how i go about it and I heard you guys talking about how much John was a jerk and all that. And, like, that's cool. But, like, in a messed up way, it makes me wish I kind of obsessed over my work more. Because it doesn't feel like I do enough when it comes to writing or anything else I'm trying or, or, or diving into in the entertainment industry. Like, acting or modeling or anything. Because genius stuff is, it seems to come out of obsessing over art your own art and trying to get it perfect and all that even though it like i think it has a bad track record of destroying lives mm -hmm. i just wish it just makes me wish i went a little harder like you saw how often he was writing all the time and i don't think i've even written anything towards what i'm supposed to be writing this week at all yet so it, i i kind of use it as an effed up way as like inspiration to go go hard but not try to detach myself from every living human being i've met well that's good because i think like definitely don't look and anyone listening don't look to jonathan larson and his writing techniques as inspiration because they're toxic like <laughs> and that's kind of the whole thing he mm -hmm. learns and he has to live to become a good writer and you have to do it in unison and that's just kind of how it goes if he's gonna obsess he could write all day but he's even procrastinating on his work and like that's something all writers do and it's like that his one guy says he's like well you wrote a whole song about sugar or whatever why can't you write the song for your character like we have a workshop in three days and he's just stressing out and he's not able to handle his own issues and he can't get his work done real quick that that ira guy i i thought that was jake gyllenhaal in like heavy makeup the dude with the mustache yep wow. i thought I thought that was I could have I was like is that is he doing a different voice and he's like in like a lot of makeup that would have been a weird cameo it would have oh, wild I mean Lin-Manuel Miranda is cameoed in this I mean he directed it but he was also a cook in the kitchen and he said something was it Spanish I want to say it was Spanish there were a lot of cameos in this a lot Bradley Whitford as Stephen Sondheim yeah. he was the racist dad in Get Out he was and he was in the West Wing. I didn't see the West Wing. Is there something about the president? Yeah, it's a Sorkin show. Be in the West Wing. It was a different time, though. It was when, like, yeah. there was optimism in politics. Yeah, I don't think I can 
watch like i love sorkin but i don't think i can watch the west wing oh he wrote that i'm good yeah (laughs) i'm gonna i'm gonna sell you on sorkin to some extent someday it's gonna probably be the social network i i really think you're gonna like the social social network network. you guys gotta stop hyping it up otherwise i'm I'm just I'm just like i'm not the huge i'm not the biggest sorkin or fincher guy but like i i enjoyed that movie i can't say when i watched it i did not have a good time I'm gonna see it as mid. If it if there's not explosions and stuff and Batman, and, and <laughs> Superman teaming up, where's Martha? By the end of it, Andrew Garfield fighting, Spider Man fighting Lex Luthor. You know. Yep. Okay, you're not gonna like the social network. <laughs> <laughs> Unless that computer smash at the end really does it for you. <laughs> um, like yeah. It it is pretty satisfying to see that like the keys coming off and all that. Mm. What were we what? Okay. writing experience yeah yeah well to go off of like some of what you were saying like i think david said something to this effect I-, I think it's fine that you don't like obsess over your work i've only heard of that leading to just disaster and not even really leading to good art i don't think i've ever done my best work under heavy stress and maybe that's just me maybe other people are different with that but i i really don't see any point in like glorifying intense struggle for being creative but doesn't it give that much more life when when you do get it when you figure it out yeah doesn't it isn't it doesn't it feel rewarding i don't know i can't speak from experience just yet personally i don't think it's usually worth it like there's definitely like you can't just give up when it gets hard uh, like I'm not advocating for that. Some days you really do have to struggle through with it, but like if you're obsessing over it every minute of the day, no, that that's that's not great. And I one thing I did kind of like about this is how much we see him not necessarily procrastinating, but like the swimming scene. He has to step away from his work to get the breakthrough he's looking for. And I think so that's he beat writer's block. Yeah, some days I'll I've had that in the past where I'm just like I really like there's some issue with whatever I'm writing and I'm just like I don't know how to get this and I sit there for an hour and get nowhere. By the end of it I'm just like or I'm no closer to getting this than I was when I sat down. But then maybe the next day I'll take 5 minutes of sitting down and I just get it. It's like, "Oh, there it is. There that's the solution to that thing." Or it'll come, like, a week later when I'm just doing something totally different. When I'm, like, at work. Or, I don't know, anything. Like, I I liked that that part of the process was shown. Like, yes, there is value in sitting down and, like, just getting the work done. Obviously, you have to do that. But also, like, taking a step away is a valuable thing to do. There's a reason people sometimes say they get their best ideas in the shower. Sometimes your brain is kind of at its best when you're doing something I mean, different. Mine be when I'm trying to sleep, and that be the most annoying thing. Like, I just get a, an overflow of, I wasn't thinking mm-hmm. about writing the whole day. And then all of a sudden my brain was like, you know what would be a good idea this? And then he just, he just, it just keeps coming, keeps coming. I'm trying to sleep, and I got to keep opening my phone to write these notes down for later so I don't forget them. And... I hate that. Sometimes I lose sleep because of that, and that's not good. I've definitely had that, though. It happens more often for me when I'm trying to sleep than when I'm in the shower, but it does happen when I'm in the shower. I get ideas when I'm driving. That's, like, my go-to. Mm. Ooh, that's a good one. I need to be alone, though. Alone in a car, listening to music. Mm-hmm. It's just, like, boom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If there's other people there, vibes messed up. Yeah, that's when you kick him out the car when you're going yeah, like you 60 miles an hour. Like, that's what I say. So I would have been like, get out. Uh, I, 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 I got it. 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 I got it but he doesn't sell he doesn't at the end of the day economically physically he moves nowhere everything changes internally 
and I was like, whatever for that. But I did like that reality because that's a, that's just the reality of being a writer. If he sold there, it would have been so like, okay. I mean, they were trying to tell him from the beginning, but as an artist, you kind of want to. You have to believe in your own work first before anybody else does. But if nobody's believing in work after you do, there might be an issue there. He yeah. might have wanted to take note of that. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it took two more plays for it to go boom, so to speak. But um, he, he did get there. Unfortunately, he didn't get to see. He didn't win until he, until he won with Rent. You pay your rent is the ti- the title. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going. Have either of you seen Rent? No. No. I know it has kind of a mixed reputation. I know the 500,000 song. Okay. I've seen only the movie version. And, like, I can see there's obviously some stuff Lynn's playing too, which is, like, cute. But I don't know. Rent's fine. I, I knew enough it about little... it to know that, like, there were a couple allusions to it. Like,. Yeah. Some of the stuff about know. literally paying rent, I was no. like, oh, yeah, that comes up in rent. Yeah, that's one of the first songs. How about? I don't know any other song from it. Yeah, but, but now yeah, you know how many minutes are in a year, so. And, like, Jonathan's whole relationship with his with Michael and Michael's relationship with HIV. That's right. very prominent in rent, but it's, you know. And I, I, I've read online that some people say Maureen from rent is supposed to be Susan. Which is interesting. Well, it was a mix of Susan and whoever Vanessa Hutchins plays. And I Caressa? That was interesting. Yeah. I was like, interesting. Caressa I didn't think, and Vanessa. Sorry. I didn't think her character really had much of a character. Nope. But okay. I didn't know she had a name until he said it. Yeah, she's more than halfway me, through the She's movie. just the one who sings alongside him in the performance, right? Yep. Yeah. Like, okay. the only time she really ever speaks is, like, towards the end, and she's like, can I see the song? And he's like, later. Hey, boy, genius. Yeah. She sung more than she You're spoke. killing me, Larson. Yeah, she did sing more than anything else. So that's why I was surprised that she was compared to Maureen, because Maureen has a very bombastic personality in Rent. But, yeah. Oh, no. I think people are really forcing the narrative because Rent is so famous and so in the zeitgeist, and people just love to have those connections, and they want to force that all the way. But, like, I don't think it's that deep as some people are making it out to be which is fine because i don't think rent is really as good as it has been glorified to which is fa- you know that's that's musical theater cats not really the best show ever no it was the longest running not. show for a while why i don't know and now phantom's the longest running show and don't get me wrong phantom is a good show but the longest running show really now the cats movie now we're uh, talking. Oh, God. <laughs> Cat, Cats might have the most memorable character names out of anything. I think it does win that award. The Stoffelies guy. Tucker is kind of hard to beat. That one. Uh, McCavity. McCavity. Actually, yeah. those are the only two that There's I know. the old sad one who sings Memory. I used to know her name. The thing Rosa says about writing the next one, you, you guys... It, well, David specifically said uh, that was like cute. I I found that depressing. It was like, but well, that's you, real. You, like the fact that you can't even like it doesn't seem like you can revel in what you've made just makes me. I said makes me dislike, and then I couldn't finish the thought. Uh, not dislike writing, but dislike. I guess that aspect of of writing or selling your writing. Yeah, like that's why I'd want to be attached to projects while also writing the next one so i'm still like reveling 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 in my uh previous work which is why as like selling stuff i'd want to be a showrunner perhaps or something like i'm in as long as i'm involved in the process of what i sell i'm cool with that but like writing and selling and then moving on to the next like where's the fun in that like writing's cool and i like I have fun writing, but, like, I also want to see everything behind the scenes of how it gets made. Because, you know, I wrote it. I don't want to view it as an audience member. Yeah, but to that point, he doesn't sell. Yes. But I'm talking about me when when I'm doing it. Yeah, I know. But that's why it's like, if he did sell, I I think it would be more, you would see that more inspirational, him reveling in it. But, like, when you don't sell, yeah. 
you just gotta pull yourself up and right go to the next because no do. one the reality of any writer is like no one's asking you to be a writer yeah well until they are like until they are until you're getting hired to do stuff but before until that you have, you have to be such doing a reputation page. that people are banging down your door for like just stupid reasons there's a really kind of awkward in between stage there and for any new writer anyone more our level that's aspiring to break into a professional mold no one's asking us to be writers there are plenty of people who are trying to get into those rooms like the, no one is begging us no one's like please we need david evan and jelani stories and or else the world will not be saved so like it is kind of just a reality where either they're in it or they're not and when they're not into it you just kind of have to keep going and try to figure out what's gonna hopefully sell or get some form of traction so then you have leverage so people will come to you and say i saw you did this so would you want to do this and then that's when you get meta and make a story about how you couldn't sell your stories yes um, like and adaptation then, yeah. and then it gets strange to the point where you like the character that's like a stand-in for you like starts killing the producers that like rejected them like that would have been cool if like it got that weird yeah like a revenge thing just and then, anything interesting honestly no producers rejected me yet so i didn't have a reason to say any of that but i'm saying like yeah rejection's a part of the industry so definitely best to get used to it it's gonna feel personal like it you, people say the re- I, I feel like some people might say like rejection or rejections get like easier over time it don't it actually starts getting worse the the more they happen well it's just for me but i feel like that a lot of people feel that way but might not admit it and it's it's gonna feel personal because you wrote or did whatever you did and that that person was just like well this isn't good enough for me so you know it'd be like that but it's just you you gotta keep going not necessarily move on to the next thing because maybe you will find somebody that likes it but don't don't stay stuck in in that i think one like i'm not gonna say it's the solution to it but one thing that i've found very good for like just being creative consistently is you know find projects that you care about that you're willing to go back and do every day or at least most days like something that actually interests you and i think that can be a danger like sometimes i'll hear people say like i want to write something that's definitely going to sell it's so commercial and like this is exactly what the industry is looking for and i feel like every story i hear about that ends with yeah it turned out the industry moved on a couple years later or nope they didn't actually want that or like the thing that i wrote that was really personal turned out to be the thing they were actually interested in right what you know yeah, I feel like it's better to write the thing that, like, is personal to you, and hopefully that is the thing that is going to sell, because, you know, anyone out there can try to follow a trend. Everyone out there is trying to follow the trends, but, I don't know, maybe try to, like, try to write Get Out instead of Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Because that one's already on the way, so you might want to try four, but get out. Yep, that's cool. Right. Well, just as the example, like, I'm just trying to make a comparison yeah, between, like, the thing that is a repeat of what's been done versus something that nobody was doing and then changed the industry completely. What happened to zombies, man? I feel like there was, like, a really short period where, like, people were doing, like, Greek guys and stuff. And then then zombies like blew up for like a couple years and now it's just been superheroes since marvel well they've tried bringing them back but it's been in the form of army of the dead and gods of egypt so oh boy. not a whole lot of success oh no uh just one thing that you guys kind of alluded to or some of us have throughout all of this is like the relationship between ego and writing i feel like is it's sort of a weird balance like i mentioned before like how i don't like how much of a dick john is at some points and like how i kind of have tried to fight that in like that urge in myself to be like a dick about being creative i think when you're writing something like it's good to try to take your 
ego out of the equation. I think it's healthier to do that both for your work and yourself. But at the same time, like you want to write something that you think is meaningful to other people. And it can be really hard to know when you're just kind of being arrogant about that and just like, oh, yes, my vision, like people need to see it versus like I actually have something good here. Because in both cases, like you're thinking like like the, the thought you're getting to is people can get something out of what I have made. But like it's just it's a difficult balance, I think, to like to be able to say that and not have your ego be too much in that equation. I feel like that comes up in Tick Tick Boom a bit. Like John definitely has an ego and an arrogance about him. I got like pretty annoyed when I think yeah, it's in like, really the second like song. Him. He goes like some guys like who are you and he goes I am the future of musical theater. I was like, "All right, pump your brakes, dude." Yeah. It, it's just but It's just a pretentious time, thing like to say. Have we all have we not all met someone like that? Cuz I have. I I probably have. I might have um, blocked them out of my memory. At certain points um, I might have come off like that. I hate to say that, but it's probably true. Um, probably probably why did i come off like that when you met me <laughs> no not at all but the stories i'm hearing from classes i didn't have with you pretty crazy yeah. well you didn't have any classes with me sophomore year sophomore year was the worst for that um, oh boy yeah very last thing um john never throws a wadded up piece of paper into an overflowing garbage can in this movie so he's canceled and he's not a real writer because he never does that that's the staple of every writer <laughs> for every m- movie with the writer yep so that you know what? I don't like this movie anymore because of that. I actually really appreciated that he didn't do that. But I was like, oh, he never did that. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Where was he the must've... For You song? <laughs> and I would do it for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we didn't We didn't for have a skateboarding you. montage for him. A jeans commercial hell? in the middle of the movie. I'm sorry. These are all Spider-Man references. <laughs> Our next episodes are going to be Parasite and Shrek 2. Yeah, check out our YouTube channel. Uh, we have our Patreon for $1 a month. If you liked our conversation today, probably check out also on Patreon our early writing experiences episode. We talk about some like similar things on that. Our merchandise is on Zazzle. Our logo is by Kelsey Hendry. Uh, the show is on Twitter at intanalysis18. I'm on Twitter at ev underscore Wes. And where are both of you at? I'm on Instagram at Jelani T. Kelly. Twitter at Jelani T. Kelly. YouTube at Base Phoenix. Um, and if you're interested in hiring your boy for an acting role, I just landed my first acting thing today. So. Oh, yeah. And check out, check out the skits. Some really good skits on hit, Base hit, Phoenix YouTube. Hit, hit your boy. Up. I got to do the next one. Oh, boy. The job interview one is a little too, too relatable. <laughs> oh, yeah. In a good way, but it's a little too relatable. <laughs> That's yeah. That was the point. Relatability sells shares, sells gives. Go ahead, David. Find me at Interior Analysis on YouTube. <laughs> Do find it there. Uh, make sure you give us that one dollar a month. I'm sure you give more to those streaming companies. So that that Patreon one dollar a month thing. We keep talking about these these live watch longs. Y'all gonna want to be there for that. You never know when it's gonna drop because these episodes come out days later. So make sure you're subscribed to that. Yeah. Um. Uh, un- until next time, sing when it's too strong for dancing or whatever the thing was. What? I I don't know. I was trying to find a button to put on it. Somebody else. No, I had better. one. Uh. <laughs> Just watch Hamilton on Disney Plus. Like it's just a better time. Yeah. <laughs>